Serial killers are part of our news and culture. It's chilling to think of a disturbed individual targeting victim after victim. What's worse is when that killer is young. Aaron Caffey and Charlie Wilkinson were serial killing teenagers who shocked the US back in 2008. Who are they? Who got blood on their hands? I'll tell you the whole story. The Caffey family. I'm going to start by looking at the family of Aaron Caffey. Charlie Wilkinson comes into the story a little later. I'm beginning here because Erin's family plays a main role in this terrible true crime tale. Hearing about her background makes it even more surprising that things ended such a bloody and brutal way. Erin was born in the town of Alba, Texas. Her life up to the age of 16 was shaped by religion. Her parents were churchgoers and she was very much involved in that faith and lifestyle. As ministers at the conservative Baptist church Miracle Faith in Texas, Terry and Penny Caffey lived devoutly and expected certain things from their children. The family was based in the city of Celeste, having moved there from Alba specifically to be a greater part of Miracle Faith. It was apparently a life filled with worship, prayer, and music. Penny played the piano. Meanwhile, Aaron's younger brother Tyler, aged eight, played the guitar, and Matthew, aged 13, played the harmonica. Erin herself was a singer, and she was good at it. If you look at photos of the Caffeys, they seem like a happy and wholesome family. Maybe they were in earlier times. However, times change. And it wasn't long before Erin was growing up, and the moral values she shared with Terry and Penny started to crumble. Erin was about to meet Charlie Wilkinson, and all hell would break loose. Before I go into that, I want to mention something that happened which upset the household and gives you further insight into what was going on behind closed doors with the Caffeys. She was famously homeschooled, but what led to this move by her parents? Reportedly, what happened was that a girl at school attempted to kiss her. This didn't go down well with Terry and Penny. They took her out of the eighth grade at the age of 13 and delivered her education at home, where such supposed dangers couldn't befall their daughter again. Apparently, she was quite isolated in this situation. She was shy and didn't have many friends. Of course, I'm not suggesting that the family's strict religious code or the homeschooling had any connection with the dark and disturbing events that unfolded. It's not my place to speculate about things like that. Indeed, I'm not qualified to. Yet, with such a bloody crime, it helps to get an overall picture. And it shows how Aaron's activities were placed under scrutiny, something that surely created pressure for everyone. With things becoming complex within the family, the situation was building to something explosive. The crunch time happened when Aaron met and fell in love with a boy who would go from teenage beau to partner in crime. I'm talking about Charlie Wilkinson. Aaron meets Charlie. At 16, Erin went to work at her local Sonic drive-in as a fast food waitress. It was a part-time job, but one that impacted her life full-time. It was here that she first met Charlie, who was 18 years old. This would throw a spanner in the works of the family's stability. The relationship would also go on to cause untold harm and devastation. How so? Let me talk you through it. I can't quite imagine what it was like for Erin, going from an isolated position at home to being among people her own age. She must have been involved with individuals at Miracle Faith, but the thing with fast food restaurants is that all kinds of people go there. She was probably exposed to a side of life she hadn't seen before. That was definitely true in the case of Charlie Wilkinson. As described by Oxygen, he was a somewhat rough and tumble outdoors type. Naturally, Terry and Penny wanted to know about this new relationship, and reportedly, Erin wasn't forthcoming with the details. Which isn't surprising if you think about it. Most of us have stories about young love and how mortifying it is to tell our parents. This, however, went beyond the boundaries of a normal relationship. Medium writes that Charlie was a high school senior and known as hot-tempered, but he had never been arrested previously. He had no serious discipline problems at school, so Charlie hadn't been in that much trouble. Nevertheless, he was a wild card in this very ordered and disciplined household. Terry Caffey told AOL News in 2010 that he wasn't happy with Erin's new boyfriend from the get-go. Early on, I had reservations about the young man. There were just things about him that didn't sit right with me. This report also states that the Caffeys kept their distance, thinking maybe that passions would die down between the pair. Unfortunately, they didn't. Not only did the relationship blossom rapidly, but Erin asked to go back to school. This enabled her to be close to Charlie much of the time. He reportedly wanted to marry her and gave her a promise ring. This was a family heirloom passed down from Charlie's grandmother. It sounds sweet, really. The type of scenario you might see in a movie. The rebellious young couple with a deep connection to each other. Meanwhile, the family grows ever more anxious. Ultimately, the situation couldn't carry on the way it had been. There were several factors that contributed to matters going downhill. 
and once things started to slide, tensions began to boil over with horrible consequences. Downward spiral. To Terry and Penny's dismay, Erin's work at school suffered. She reportedly wasn't applying herself as the distractions of a relationship took their toll. There was no sign that this was going to fizzle out. What can parents do in such a situation? It was time for them to really put their foot down. Before they did, however, events would take a dark turn. And not just for Aaron and Charlie's personal life. Terry received a terrible shock when he went to visit his father on the 21st of February 2008. Tragically, Clarence Caffey had passed away meaning Terry was coping with grief at the same time as managing his daughter's relationship. This wasn't about to get any easier either. An unpleasant surprise was waiting, in the form of Charlie Wilkinson's MySpace page. While Charlie appeared to keep his nose relatively clean in public, online it was a different story. He talked about sex and booze on social media, alarming Terry and Penny and leading them to try and separate the couple for good. A phone curfew had been imposed, which Erin had broken. Her punishment was that she would be grounded, plus her keys and phone would be confiscated. Things were getting out of control, so the time had come to break up Erin and Charlie. Only they didn't want to break up. The reportedly hot-headed Charlie was angry, but Erin reacted in a more extreme way. According to friends of hers, who spoke to Texas Monthly, she was making some disturbing statements to them. When I say disturbing, I mean it. You see, Erin had a solution to her problems. One that would mean she could keep seeing Charlie without interference. What was the solution? A private method of communication that no one knew about? Maybe a secret meeting place? No. Erin figured that her parents needed to die. Now, that is a pretty crazy thing to say, even for a teenager. I wonder what went through her friends' minds as she said it. It could have just sounded like a girl mouthing off and getting her frustrations out in the open. Turned out, she wasn't simply venting. The death of her parents was something that was being planned. It would happen five months after Erin and Charlie met. Her schoolyard talk was about to become a horrifying reality. I'm going to go into detail concerning what happened on the night of March 1st. It was a night that would shatter the Caffey family and make sure nothing was the same ever again. Erin's parents are attacked. It was the middle of the night when the attack took place. The time was reportedly around 2 a.m. A car drove to the family home with Charlie behind the wheel. He wasn't on his own. Accompanying him was Charles Wade, age 20, and Bobby Gale Johnson, Wade's girlfriend, who was 18. The group was armed with guns and a samurai sword. While her parents and brothers slept, Erin snuck outside to let them in. The most unsettling detail of this entire case, aside from the brutality, was Erin's attitude. According to reports, she was totally okay with what was going to happen. Charlie had told Erin that everyone would have to be killed, even her brothers, Matthew and little Tyler. Killer couples reveals her cold-blooded response. I don't care, just do what you gotta do. I can't get those words out of my mind. It was the moment her family was about to die in the most horrendous way possible. She just did not care at all by Charlie's account. Now, I'm going to describe what took place within those walls on that appalling night. This sequence is obviously not for the faint-hearted. It features some violent and distressing content, which I feel I should warn you about. Terry and Penny's room was visited first. Terry wrote about the terrifying experience for The Forgiveness Project. When the door burst open, he thought it was one of his children. My first instinct was that one of the kids had had a nightmare. Then gunfire erupted. It's the loudest sound you can ever imagine. Wilkinson used a 22 caliber pistol and sprayed the room with bullets. Terry desperately tried to protect his wife as the gun barrel blazed. I threw my arm across Penny and took shots in my arm and face, which blew me out of bed and knocked me out. He'd been struck by five bullets. Terry described regaining consciousness. Presumably, this was to check whether he was alive or dead. In spite of the fact that he was bleeding from his eyes, nose, mouth, and ears, he wanted to get up, but he couldn't. Terry said that he couldn't feel anything on his right side. He couldn't see where Penny was. The horror continued as Terry realized that, having attacked him and Penny, the children were the intruder's next targets. He could hear footsteps and became frantic as he tried to get back up. It was then that he heard Matthew's voice. No, Charlie, no. Why are you doing this? Terry then knew who his attacker was. How do you even begin to understand what that must feel like? The revelation was gut-wrenching, and there was even worse to come. Bloodbath. Gunfire came from upstairs. Terry couldn't see, but it was the sound of Matthew being executed. As for poor Tyler, he reportedly tried to hide in the closet. Wilkinson and Wade found him and killed him with the sword. 
I won't go into the exact details as they're very upsetting. Needless to say, it was cruel and brutal. Meanwhile, Terry slipped into unconsciousness once again. He woke up to another alarming sight. The house was burning. He finally made it up off the floor in his weakened state, and that was when he saw Penny's body, lying on the floor on the other side of the bed. She had been killed with a combination of bullets and sword blows, which almost decapitated her. Reports state that he already knew she was dead and had watched her pass away. He just didn't see the damage that had been done until later. I imagine Terry must also have been wondering about Aaron. So much devastation had happened so quickly. In another cold-blooded move, Wilkinson and Wade had robbed the place before torching it using lighter fuel. Apparently, Wade was going to be paid $2,000 for taking part in the bloodbath. While on the scene, Terry dragged his way out of the house to save himself from being killed in the fiery aftermath. According to his account in The Forgiveness Project, he escaped through the bathroom window. It was then a case of reaching his neighbors for help. However, this was no easy task. Next door was actually a long distance away. Terry describes it as being equal to approximately four football pitches. It took him an hour to get there. This further ordeal was surely a soul-destroying experience for Terry. He talks about how he nearly gave up halfway through, but pushed himself on for the sake of his family. Terry wanted to tell the police the name of the person who'd done this to Penny and the children. Thankfully, he made it there and the authorities were called. Aaron, Charlie, Charles Wade, and Bobby Gale Johnson probably drove away from the crime scene thinking everything was over. In fact, it was far from finished. Unbeknownst to them, Terry had survived and had his sights set on getting justice. It wasn't long before the police caught up with the teenagers and held them accountable for what they'd done. I'll tell you how it all played out next. Aftermath Terry was extremely lucky to have made it out of that situation alive. He needed emergency surgery before he could talk to the cops about the perpetrator. In arresting Charlie Wilkinson, the whole terrible story opened up, and Terry learned who else was involved. When the horrifying truth came out, it did so slowly and painfully. It took around three hours for the teenagers to be found by police. Aaron was discovered inside a trailer, and it's here that things take a surprising twist. When coming face to face with law enforcement, she told them that she had in fact been kidnapped. They had no reason to disbelieve her, so she was released to her family, specifically Aaron's grandparents. However, this apparent deception didn't last. In police custody, Charlie Wilkinson, Charles Wade, and Bobby Gale Johnson were spilling the beans. They all pointed the finger at Aaron as the person who came up with the idea of killing her family. Wade revealed he was being paid for taking part in the slaughter. Wilkinson would mention the chilling moment he told Aaron that he would have to kill her brothers and her giving him the terribly, horribly casual response to go ahead. Aaron assured her family that she wasn't behind the slayings. Terry had to grapple with the idea that she may have planned the deaths of his wife and children. Whatever the cafes thought, it was what the authorities concluded. The net was tightening on Erin, and the police arrested her as she was going to the hospital to see her dad. This dreadful situation was out of the family's hands. When the news came in, it was bad. The four teenagers were charged with three counts of capital murder to begin with. Speaking to AOL News, Terry revealed what happened to him in the aftermath of the murders. He took a cardboard box containing all his worldly possessions and went to sleep on his sister's couch. This was an extremely dark time, as you can imagine. At one stage, Terry was going to take his own life. However, unbeknownst to him, he was about to go on a journey of forgiveness. Returning to his former home, he intended to commit suicide. He says, I went back there and stood on the ashes and began to cry to God. I said, God, I don't understand why you took my family. Why did you do this? I just don't understand. It was a time of revelation for the struggling father. According to Terry, he looked down after this moment and noticed a burnt page from a book an author friend had given the family earlier. This was a novel called Blind Sight by Jim Pence, and it was about a man who loses his whole family in a tragedy. This is a staggering coincidence. And when Terry read the page, which was attached to a tree, he was truly astonished. I picked it up and it read, I couldn't understand why you would take my family and leave me behind to struggle along without them. I may never totally understand that part of it, but I do know that you are sovereign. You are in control. Terry says that he sank to his knees. The incredible find had stopped him from ending it all. Not only that, but it set him on a path that he maybe never expected. As this was happening, his daughter and her friends were in an entirely different place behind bars and with no chance of escape. They were facing a lonely future. How was justice ultimately meted out to the teenage serial killers? Sentencing. With the prospect of decades of imprisonment ahead of them, it seemed the killers were turning on each other. Erin stated that she attempted to flee the scene on the terrible night. 
However, Charlie made her stay in the car. This detail is reportedly believed by Terry. As for Charlie, he said he was the one who wanted to run away, rather than handle things in such a brutal manner. It took a matter of months for the sorry drama to run its course. Charlie and Charles Wade were the first to be sentenced. It was them who'd actually carried out the slaughter. A judgment of life imprisonment without parole was handed down in October that year. In January 2009, Bobby Gale and Aaron admitted their guilt. Bobby Gale received two 40-year sentences, which would run concurrently. What about Aaron? With a charge of capital murder ringing in her ears, she went on to receive a life sentence. Both girls are eligible for parole. Bobby Gale can apply for it in 24 years. Meanwhile, Erin has to wait until she is 59 years old. Her father ultimately decided to forgive everyone involved. Can you imagine that? It must take an incredible amount of inner strength and faith to come to such a conclusion. Terry went further than just reconciling himself with the idea. However, when Charlie Wilkinson and Charles Wade were in line for the death penalty, Terry appealed for them to be shown mercy. He not only wrote letters, but he also protested publicly over the move. Again, I'm amazed he managed to do that. I'm not sure I could find that forgiveness in my heart, and I'm certain you're thinking the same thing. He did reportedly find it very tough. After he resolved to help the boys, a tense moment followed. In a highly charged development, Wilkinson and Wade agreed to sit down face to face with Terry. This was a condition of a plea deal they'd entered into. Terry revealed that Charlie was the only one who opened up to him. He kept looking down and cried a little bit. It was pretty tough for him. He told his lawyer later that it was the toughest thing he ever had to do. And I said, that's good. I hope wherever they are right now, these individuals are grateful for what Terry did for them. Of course, Terry forgave Aaron before Charlie Wilkinson and Charles Wade. He visits her in prison apparently going there every few months. It looks like the pair of them have rebuilt their relationship, at least as much as could be expected under the circumstances. And while Erin Caffey is behind bars, she's been telling the world her own story via the media. Erin of the years. Over a decade may have passed since the Caffey family were killed, yet Erin is still in the public eye. She has chosen to do this voluntarily, taking part in interviews with some of TV's most high-profile figures. Dr. Phil spoke to her as part of his show in 2014, where he found a young woman who wasn't able to speak openly about the night her mother and brothers met their end. Dr. Phil shows Erin's statements from her fellow teenagers, in which they identify her as the person who came up with a murderous plan. She denies that she wanted her parents to be actually killed, stating, You know, every young girl says, Oh, I wish my parents were dead, but I didn't mean it. While showing her that he understands, Dr. Phil is still wanting her to admit to a bigger role in the massacre. He brings out her phone records and reiterates that Terry is still supporting her side of the story. Dr. Phil asks her point blank whether she was behind the plan. At first, Erin just shakes her head before saying, I probably added fuel to the fire. Shortly after this, she tearfully nods, admitting that she gave the go-ahead for the murders to take place. This episode is made all the more powerful because Dr. Phil is showing his pre-recorded interview to Terry himself, who sits in the studio. Dr. Phil tells Terry that, in his opinion, Erin is not telling the whole truth, either to herself or the public. Want more in-depth videos about some of America's worst true crime cases? Here are some other stories that will shock and surprise you.